great. Welcome. I can see people starting to join today's session. Um, I'm going to try and get a set up with our LinkedIn live stream. For those of you who are maybe watching this on, you can watch this on LinkedIn or watch this recording, you will be able to access this recording after the session, but hopefully also be able to access this on LinkedIn as well. Hopefully I'll be able to get this all set up. Okay, for some reason that's not wanting to do that. While I have a look at that, I'm going to um, just welcome everyone to today's session. We are going to be having a bit of a taste lecture, a bit of introduction to medical neuroscience. My name's Bethany. I'm the International Officer for the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Science here at Swansea University. And very pleased to be joined today by Professor Phil Newton, who is our Programme Director for the Medical Neuroscience MSc Programme here. So um, today's session is just going to be sort of a bit of a taste lecture, a bit of introduction into the program here at Swansea, also the topic of medical neuroscience, um, just to give you a better, bit of better understanding, hopefully get you excited about the possibilities of, of the program. So without any sort of further hold up, I'm going to hand over now to Professor Newton. Thanks, Bethany, and welcome, everyone. Let me just share my screen. And just ask Bethany to tell me whether she can see the slides okay. And it's the slides and not the notes pages. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. It's um, it's always a challenge to give a taste of lecture for neuroscience because um, I've got about half an hour, 40 minutes to talk about something that I could talk about for 30 days if I was given the chance. So we're going to trim it down, and I'm just going to run through three important features uh, for the taste of lecture for this morning. So we'll talk very briefly about what the course is all about. What is What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Then I will spend a few moments just talking about the structure of the course. So we'll run through very basically what the course looks like from a modular perspective, the sorts of people who'll be teaching it, the sorts of topics that we'll cover. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about the neuroscience of learning. And so having racked my brains for just picking one topic to talk about for half an hour, I thought I'd do a general overview of the neuroscience of learning because this is the thing that I'm most interested in. And recognizing that those of you who are thinking about doing a master's course are probably also thinking about doing finals and the end of your undergraduate degrees in the next few months, we'll try and give you a couple of practical tips for how you can link that in for revising and preparing for assessments. Okay, so what is this course all about? Um, it's a new course in the medical school, at MSc Medical Neuroscience, and that's a very specific, a very deliberate choice of title, and I'm going to explain why. It's a medical course because we are in a medical school. So part of what we're trying to do as a medical school is to help people with their health and their well-being. There is an increasing burden of neurological and psychiatric disorders amongst an aging population, and many of those are active subjects for research within the medical school. And so we're trying to bring that out in the taught courses that we offer. So things like dementia, which are rapidly increasing due to an aging population. It's a big feature of what we do in the medical neuroscience course. And then there are other disorders, things like anxiety and depression, which are increasing in prevalence in part due to an increased recognition of the significance of them, <clears throat> excuse me, and affecting in this case, often a younger population. And then there are medical situations that are becoming recognized and respected more as simply a difference in the neurological uh, profiles of individual people. So neurodiversity, things like autism and some aspects of ADHD and other situations, increasing in recognition, uh, increasing in the medical understanding of those. And again, they feature as part of our course. So we've got a medical focus because we're a medical school, essentially, and we want to try and help people with some of those very serious and significant challenges. However, there is also a more fundamental reason why we study these medical situations within neuroscience, and that's because neuroscience is in many ways a great mystery. We don't really fully understand 
how the brain works, how it does the things that it's supposed to do. So what does consciousness look like? For example, in a neurological perspective, what does cognition look like? What does it mean to say we are thinking about something? Other very basic questions like sleep. Why do we sleep? It puts us in an evolutionary disadvantage for a third of our lives, spending eight hours a day in a very vulnerable position. And yet evolution has selected for it and kept it, kept us doing it, which means it must be very important. And why is that? And what's the neuroscience of that, which we'll touch on a little bit later on as well. And then simple things like why do we make the decisions that we do? Why did why did I decide to eat half an Easter egg for breakfast this morning rather than something more healthy when I knew what the healthy thing to do was? I knew that I shouldn't eat an Easter egg for breakfast, but I did it anyway. What's the neuroscience of why we make those poor decisions? And how does that impact then situations like um, uh, addiction and personality disorders and other areas where people make poor decisions? So part of the answering of those basic fundamental questions in neuroscience comes from understanding the medical situation. So it's very difficult to study um, the adult human brain, and yet the adult human brain goes wrong very often. So, for example, when somebody has had a stroke, they may then have some problems with their behavior, with their ability to move or to speak or to make decisions. They will also have very clearly damage to particular parts of the brain. And what that then tells us then is that before they had the stroke, and in healthy people who haven't yet had a stroke, the parts of the brain that are now damaged in those individuals are probably responsible for the normal control of those particular behaviors. So when people have speech problems after a stroke, for example, and we can see that they have damage to certain parts of the brain, that tells us that those parts of the brain are probably responsible for speech in normal, healthy um, human adults. And so it allows us, by studying the medical situation, also gives us an important window into the basic functioning of the human brain. So that's why we have a medical neuroscience program. What does our program actually look like? I'm just going to run you quickly through the structure of it. So on the right-hand side here, you will see a fairly complicated looking diagram that we'll walk through in a stepwise way that shows you the different modules of the program. So if I just change my pointer and I'll walk you through it. So here you have the structure of the course for students who are starting in October, although we do allow students also to start in January. And here we have most of the modules and then these two longer thin ones here. And I'm gonna run you through each of these in order. The first thing to say, though, is that most of the modules are what we call short blocks. So they're one or two weeks. It's intensive learning during those one or two weeks, but it creates then gaps in between those modules that are very deliberate, in part because it allows students then to do things like seminars, work on the dissertation, do the, meet with their personal tutor. But it also makes the program, we think, more affordable and more flexible for students who want to do the program but don't necessarily want to completely relocate to Swansea if they live uh, within a driving distance away, they can come on campus for these short blocks um, and then do the rest of spend the rest of their time living off campus. And that, in a cost of living crisis, appears to make the program more accessible for those students. All right, so I'm going to run you through the modules one by one. So we'll start with Foundations in Medical Neuroscience, that is run by some bloke called Phil Newton. And the purpose of this particular module is really just to make sure that everyone on the program reaches the same basic level of understanding of the foundational principles in neuroscience before they go on to do the rest of the program. So essentially a leveling up of people's knowledge. And this is because we have people who come to do the course from uh, having done a very great deal of neuroscience and so have a very good understanding. But then we have people who've come from a STEM degree or even a, a medical engineering or biological engineering degree or psychology or an education background. They're interested in neuroscience, but they maybe haven't done as much of the core principles in their undergraduate degree. And this short 10 credit module is designed to help students make sure that they've got the core understanding before they go on to do the more complicated stuff. Um, some students find this very easy, some of them a little more challenging. Uh, the content is also all available online. So uh, on my YouTube channel, many of the videos for this course are available and the students will engage with the videos, do some, um, uh, some quizzes and other activities, uh, some seminars in person if they want to, 
um, but it all gets students to the same place. It also allows for students to start a little bit late, recognizing that some international students have had problems with getting visas and accommodation and so on. This having this progress, this content online means those students are not disadvantaged. They can get on with the course, even if they're not yet able to move to Swansea, if that's what they want to do. OK, so having done that, then students move on to the medical neuroanatomy uh, module. And this this is really one of the jewels in the crown of our program. It's run by two of our medical neuroanatomy teachers. So Chris Summers and Sam Webster. These are people who teach on our medicine and our physician's associate degrees. Some of you may also know Dr. Sam Webster as a YouTube star. I believe he has uh, two thirds of a million people subscribed to his anatomy uh, YouTube channel. And this module is a very hands-on in-person understanding and learning about the anatomy of the human nervous system. Um, you can basically get your hands on some brains, get to navigate your way around the human nervous system and the human brain through some very practical hands-on sessions with these two folks. And even though this is a new program, the students who've done the course um, were giddy with excitement with this module. It's I've never seen students so happy and enthusiastic with the teaching of one of their courses. And it really, really helps them get a good understanding of how the brain is all put together. Um, this does, however, set the bar very high then for the next module, which is Advanced Learning Memory and Cognition, which is, again, some bloke called Phil Newton. And this is called an advanced module because I teach a more basic version of this module to our undergraduate students. If you're not one of our undergraduate students and you're coming from outside Swans University, that's fine. You'll get the basic content in the Foundations module. And this module then is all about how why we learn, how we think, what happens when it goes wrong, some very um, challenging real world situations that we don't necessarily think of as learning and memory disorders, things like addiction, um, obesity, ADHD, and how those are caused by and impacted by changes to the basic neuroscience of learning, memory and cognition. It's really designed to help students with taking a problem solving approach to those situations. So this, the, uh, the content is all based upon clinical and real world problems that students then solve throughout learning the content of the module. It's Christmas. And then after Christmas, we have a research methods module. We share this with our MSc in nanomedicine. And it's really designed to give students a broad exposure to a range of different research methods. Lots of these are in the lab. But there is also some theory uh, component to this. There's some data analysis content. There are some fundamental statistics learning and how to design research um, projects within the fields of medical neuroscience and nanomedicine. It's a longer module. It's about three weeks. And at the third of those weeks is a demo week specifically aimed at medical neuroscience to really focus on some neuroscience lab techniques and research considerations. We do this uh, in February in part because we'll have students join in January and then everyone is exposed to these research methods as in part to help them learn um, the sorts of things that they might do in their dissertation and to get them thinking about what it is they want to do in their dissertation, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. The next module is then very specifically focused on neurodegeneration repair with one of our experts in this, Dr. Jeff Davis, along with Dr. Ian Thomas and Dr. Alwan and Morgan. These people are doing a lot of research on things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. They do the basic laboratory science. They're all laboratory scientists, um, but they do this in a way that is applied to the clinical situation. And, and there is contributions to this module from clinicians who are working on these conditions in a, in a clinical way. Uh, this module, I think, is starting <clears throat> next week for the students who are currently doing the course. And like I said, it's part of our research portfolio in the medical school as applied to um, the teaching that we do. So those are the first of the uh, most, I should say, of the, the short taught modules. We'll talk briefly now about these long, thin modules that run alongside. The first of these is a science communication module. This is shared with some of our MSci students. This is a largely self-directed module that's designed to help students translate science for a lay audience. And it's run by Dr. Nick Jones. He's been doing this for a number of years now. And it's the purpose of it, you know, or I should say the practical uh, face of it, is writing articles for things like The Conversation or other popular science sites that might allow 
um, research scientists to translate science into ways that's digestible for more of a lay audience. The reason we focus on this and have included this in our program is because this is actually a really good way to help you learn. Tr explaining complex topics to people who maybe don't have the complex knowledge really tests your ability to do uh, to learn those topics and to make sure and test for yourself that you have done it. Um, and that's part of the reason why we include it. And the second jewel in the crown, if you like, of this um, program is the other long, thin module, which is this contemporary issues module. Now, the purpose of this module, very simply, is to give you, the students, some choice in some of the things that you do. Because there's a lot that goes on in neuroscience and in STEM science more generally. We can't possibly cover all of it. There are some things that you might want to do. This is a way of allowing you the choice in some of those topics. So we give you a list of about 20 different short topics that are about a day each. You have to do five of them over the course of the program. Give you some examples of these. Um, Lots of students have spent a day or half a day with potential dissertation supervisors, for example, doing a, a lab meeting, um, learning a particular technique, discussing the research of a postdoc or a student within um, that laboratory, um, and then covering doing a journal club activity with a research laboratory. So research groups meet once a month, for example, to consider a new paper in the field. Someone will present it, and our neuroscience students will go along to that presentation um, uh, consider the questions they might have about it. We have a neuroimaging suite. Some of our students have done some imaging as part of this, and some of them have been imaged themselves, been chucked in the scanner and had a look at their own brain. Uh, there are some opportunities to do some behavioral experiments in biosciences. So Dr. Emma Kenyon, who will be taking over as the program director for the course, runs neuroscience experiments with um, zebrafish, for example. And then other short contemporary topics um, which come and go as the field of neuroscience changes. So I myself am running on one of these next week on the impact of the new AI tools that we're all hearing so much about on the learning of neuroscience. Basically, how much does ChatGPT know about neuroscience? And me and the students will be getting together and asking ChatGPT a whole bunch of questions and then writing a short research paper on what ChatGPT knows about it, for example. That's a topic that might be relevant for a year or two, and then maybe we'll move on to something else. The final thing to talk about then in terms of the structure of the program is a dissertation. And this is really your chance as a student to do the thing that you are really, really interested in. Um, we've been really, we've worked really hard to allow our students to really pick the supervisor that they want to work with and the sorts of thing they're going to do with that supervisor. And we run a meet the supervisors event, um, which we did last month, where all of the supervisors give a short presentation. These are the sorts of things that I'm working on. The students then pick the supervisor they want to work with. And we've been able to give all of the students their first choice of supervisor through that process. Some supervisors do lab work, some do data analysis and reviews, some do literature reviews. Some of us are involved in teaching, and students are able to do any and all of those things if they want to do it. That takes place then over the summer and is the sort of capstone element of the program. All right, so that's the program. Um, I'm now gonna spend a few minutes just giving you a taster of some of the things that we cover in the program. And I'm gonna give you a very basic overview of the neuroscience of learning. And as I said, at the end of it, I'll give you a couple of tips on how we might apply that to revision and preparing for assessments in higher education. Now, this is an enormous topic, which is difficult to do justice to in about half an hour. Um, and if you do have a detailed neuroscience understanding of these topics, uh, you will recognize that we're going to simplify this and give you a very basic story about how this works and how we might apply it to learning. Um, it's also a difficult topic to explain using examples because most of us have learned something about most things. So we're going to use a completely hypothetical example, which makes it easier for me to explain how it is that we learn. So the example we're going to use is, let's say, we're going to learn something new about apples, which doesn't happen very often. All right, so put yourself in the situation that you're preparing for the day, you've got the TV on in the background, the dog needs to be fed, the cat needs to be fed, you need to be fed, you need to get dressed, get out the door and do all the other things that you need to do in the morning. And one of the things that happens is on the breakfast news, there is a story that says three new types of apple have been discovered on the other side of the world, completely new to science. One's blue, one's orange, and one's rainbow colored. This is the topic for which we will uh, explain, through which we will explain the neuroscience of learning over the next few minutes. 
So as you're navigating your day and these things are happening in the background, a number of processes are taking place. The first of which is that your sensory systems are processing all of the sensory information that you're being presented with and turning it through the process of encoding into neuronal activity. So your eyes process light photons, your ears process sound waves, your skin processes touch and pressure. Your internal sensory systems determine whether or not you are hungry, thirsty, hot, cold, etc. Your nervous system, and in particular your brain, can't directly process sight and sound. It has to turn these into action potentials, which is basically the neuronal code. The ner cells of your nervous system follow these little electrical signals, and these are converted from sound waves, uh, light waves, and so on. And that process is called encoding. So in your morning, you're being bombarded with signals that are visual, signals that are auditory, signals that are kinesthetic from touch and pressure, internal signals that you're hungry, that you're late, that you're stressed or you're happy or whatever, all turned into the firing of nerve cells. Now you are bombarded with a huge amount of this sensor information all the time. And most of it, you're not really conscious of, you don't really pay attention to. And that's because of the actions of the first major brain region we're going to talk about, which is the thalamus. All right, let me show you where the thalamus is. Just play this through. It's the red structures there at the base and center of the brain. And we stop that playing so it's not distracting. There's a still image. Thalamus is quite a large structure, but it's close to the base and center of the brain, which means it has some quite basic functions within neuroscience. Subjects, we could talk about these for, for, for a few days. We've summarized them in two words. What the thalamus does is it acts as a sensory gate. All right, so I told you you're bombarded with a huge amount of sensory information at any one time. Most of it you're not really aware of. And that's because the thalamus doesn't let it through. Right. Your higher brain structures we're going to talk about in a few seconds, your cortex, your thinking structures, your decision-making structures, they have to do some very complex processes and they get very easily overwhelmed. And one of the ways that we stop them becoming overwhelmed is the thalamus just doesn't let them in, doesn't let information in to them. It blocks most of it out before we ever really become aware of it through operating this sensory gate. As part of making this decision about whether or not to let information through, the thalamus then talks to a second set of structures that we call the limbic system. Now, the limbic system, again, it's a very complex set of structures. Let me show you some of them highlighted here in red. They're in the middle part of the brain wrapped around um, uh, this structure called the corpus callosum. There's a lot of different structures that go into this overall system. It, they do a lot of things, but if we had to summarize it very, very simply, what the limbic system does is it stores and processes emotional memories. All right. So when the thalamus is deciding, should we let this sensory information through? Part of what it does is it talks to the limbic system and the limbic system will tell the thalamus, how do we feel about this information? All right. So let's go back to our simple model. Our sensory systems are bombarded with sensory information during our morning routine. Part of that is the sensory information that comes from the TV when the announcer says we have a story from the other side of the world. That's, we've discovered three new species of apple. Right. Your ears are listening to that. Your eyes might see some of that. You, um, that information will be processed, but you may not actually pay attention to it. You may just bounce off. Your thalamus will be deciding whether or not we should be consciously aware of that, and part of that will be talking to the limbic system. Now, if you are let's say an apple farmer or a cider maker, you might actually care a lot about the fact that three species of apple have been discovered on the other side of the world. If you really like apples, your limbic system may say, you know what, we really like apples, this sounds interesting. If you really don't like apples, your limbic system may also say, this is something we should potentially pay attention to. If you're allergic to apples, for example, all of these things will influence whether or not your thalamus lets through this one stream of information about the discovery of new apples, and in so doing, then maybe shuts out other information about whether the dog is pestering you to be fed or to be taken out, or whether the, 
the washing has been done and whether you've got the clothes that you need for this particular uh, things that you're going to be doing this morning. So let's assume that you do want to pay attention to this discovery of three new species of apple across the world. The thalamus lets that information through and that information is then processed by structures that we call the primary sensory cortices, right, which we're not really going to talk about in any detail. Essentially, there are regions within your brain that are specialized for the interpreting of visual information. There are different structures that are specialized for the interpreting of auditory sound information, other structures for touch pressure and so on. They process that information that's coming from the TV. And then a separate set of structures that we call the cortical association areas will be part of the integration of these separate sets of information. So the sights coming from the TV, the sounds coming from the TV, the emotions coming from the limbic system as a result of what's in the TV, all of these get integrated together and then sent on to and integrated in part by these structures that we call the cortical association areas. Let me show you these. This is a very simple cartoon. It's the outer surface of the brain. Your eyes would be about here where my pointer is, just under the blue structure. The back of your head is underneath the pink structure. Now, there's a lot of detail again within here, which we're going to simplify. Just under where my headphones are, I've got my parietal cortex highlighted here in yellow. And then just underneath the headphones themselves, we've got the temporal cortex highlighted in green. And there are many sub-regions of these, and these then talk to other regions deeper within the brain. But essentially, very simplistically, what these regions do is that the parietal cortex will tell us where is this information coming from, and it will orient us towards it. So if you've sat down and are looking at the TV, which is telling you this story about apples, your parietal cortex is the one that is pointing you towards it and has focused your attention upon it. Your temporal cortex is processing this all this information and telling you what it is and where you have seen it before. So your temporal cortex will be saying, that looks like apples. We've seen apples before because we're an apple farmer or a cider maker or we like eating apples. The last apple we ate was a couple of days ago. The last apple we ate should have been for breakfast, but we had an Easter egg instead and so on. Okay, so we're processing this information. We've constructed um, this information as a whole. And then we go on um, through some cortical networks that are responsible for attention, which again, we're not really gonna focus on here, but we talk about in the program because they're very important for things like ADHD. We make a selective decision to consciously pay attention to the TV. All right, so our thalamus has let this information through and said, oh, you should be aware of this. And then we've made a decision to pay attention to it, which we'll come on to in a second. There are these networks within our cortex, which will focus our attention and concentration on the TV. It's essential for these is a structure called the prefrontal cortex, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. And what it does is it will decide that we should pay attention to this and that we're going to try and learn about what it is we're being told. And this may also happen subconsciously, which is another big topic, which we'll just briefly mention here. So much of what we learn is not necessarily something we've deliberately decided to do, all right? Lots of it is, we'll sit down, we'll say, all right, I'm gonna pay attention to the TV. But lots of it will come through um, almost subconsciously. So let's say while you're watching the TV, the dog really pesters you and you get up and you make the dog's breakfast. The TV is still going on in the background. You may not even be aware that you're attending to it, but you are, and that information is being actively processed. Well, a lot of this takes place then in the, the big blue structure at the front of our brain, which is many neuroscientists, my favorite, uh, me included, our favorite part of the brain, that is our frontal cortex. And in particular, the regions towards the front of the frontal cortex that we call the prefrontal cortex. Now, this is an enormously complicated structure, which... Um, which I might upset many neuroscientists by simplifying in about five words, six words, but essentially what the prefrontal cortex does is it decides what to do. Okay, so your thalamus has let this information through. Your, uh, you've been integrated into a conscious representation, sort of the image, the, the content through. You're watching the TV. The parietal cortex is pointing you at the TV. The temporal cortex is telling you what it is. And the frontal cortex is saying, okay, let's carry on watching this or let's try and learn this, or let's think about what we're going to do with this information. 
a whole range of very complex other things that go on. And one of those in particular is that a subregion of the prefrontal cortex called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is responsible for this cognitive process that we call working memory. And working memory is absolutely essential for learning. It's absolutely fundamental. It's also absolutely hopeless. So when we're making new memories and trying to process those memories, the uh, working memory, our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is essential for this, but it has a very, very limited capacity, which is part of why the thalamus is so important for making sure that not all of the information that we're currently processing gets through to it. But to summarize very simply what this structure does, it's where information goes while you try and hold it in your head. So the examples that we'd often use is, let's say you are making a cup of tea or making a sandwich and you're trying to keep in your head all of the things that you need to do and the correct order that you need to do them in. Whilst you're holding that in your head to do it, your prefrontal cortex, in particular this dorsolateral subregion, is what's doing it. While you're trying to learn about the new apples on the TV and you're thinking about them, that information will be being processed within your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex through this cognitive process that we call working memory. Two dorsolateral prefrontal cortices, left and right sides of your temple. Now, what the prefrontal cortex does, what the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does, is it talks to the final structure in our whirlwind tour of the neuroscience of learning and memory, and that is the hippocampus. Right, let me show you where the hippocampus is and what it looks like. Again, it's this red structure. It sits kind of um, around some of the other structures that we've already talked about. And there is, again, a left and right. Take a second to look at a still image of the, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is absolutely essential for learning and memory. It does a huge number of things. But if we were to summarize it very simply and summarize two of the most important things that it does, it is essentially a memory foundry. It's where new memories are made and they are stored temporarily whilst they are constructed and shaped and sculpted and refined. It's also really important for spatial learning and spatial memory. In order for you to navigate your way from the kitchen to the TV and back again, or navigate your way to work or to university, your hippocampus is absolutely essential for doing that. The hippocampus is also one of the first brain regions that is lost during dementia, in particular Alzheimer's dementia. And that's why some of the early signs of dementia are people having problems with their memory, particularly the formation of new memories. So someone with dementia may ask you a question and you may give them an answer and it may appear that they've understood it. Half an hour, an hour later, they may ask you that same question again because they were not able to form the memory of having done that. They can't remember that they've done it. People with dementia often also report in the early stages getting lost. And that's part of the diagnostic features of Alzheimer's that people will say, well, I went to the shops and I couldn't remember how to get home. Or their friends and family members may become very concerned that navigating to and from places that used to be very familiar to them um, has become problematic because it's the hippocampus that is essential for this spatial learning. So back to our uh, more cheerful example, uh, we're trying to learn about something new, in this case, these new species of apples. Hippocampus is absolutely essential for this. And what happens is the hippocampus will do two things. It will retrieve our prior knowledge of, in this case, apples. And it does this from the cortical association areas. Remember, the cortical association areas were the regions of the brain that integrated our new um, the things that we were new things we were being exposed to. So took the information from the TV, the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, the emotional learning, and put that all together in one representation. And then they are eventually also where we will store any new learning that we have done about it. So let's say I ask you now to imagine in your head an apple. Picture an apple. Picture holding an apple in your hand. Right, and you're able to do that, or at least most of us are. The parts of the brain that are currently active that are lighting up while you do that are essentially the same parts of the brain that are active when you see an apple for the first time. 
So the vision, the, the, the visual picture of an apple takes place in your visual cortex right at the back of the head. Your emotional memories associated with the taste of an apple take part in the same regions of the brain that initially processed the taste of an apple the first time that you did it. When you've learned eventually what an apple is, that memory is stored back in those same cortical regions that process the information the first time around. When you want to learn something new, in this case about apples, but whatever it is that you're learning new, your hippocampus will go to your cortical association areas and will retrieve that existing memory and will bring it to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to working memory. In those two structures, very simplistically, the new information is integrated with the old information. So part of learning something is taking your prior learning on that subject and integrating the new content with what you already know about it. And that is true of almost anything that you learn. And is also why learning something completely new is really, really hard. If you don't have any prior knowledge of it, let's say you're trying to learn a new language completely from scratch with no learning about it at all, that's really, really hard to do because you haven't got any prior knowledge to retrieve or it's very limited. So hippocampus pulls out your old, your existing knowledge, brings it up to the top of your, or your knowledge pile, if you like, and then the new information has come through the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and these two things um, are, are melded together. That process is called essentially consolidation. And this process happens in a cyclical way over and over again. Okay, so let's say you've decided, you know what, I'm gonna pay attention to this new information about apples, and I'm gonna make sure I've learned it because it seems important for me, for my business, for what I want to do in my life. And the TV presenters say, okay, here is some where you might find some more information about it. And you go and you read the scientific papers and you read more about the content. You'll go around and around and around these cycles of retrieval and reconsolidation as you learn. You will take your existing knowledge, you will add the new knowledge to it, you'll try and store it again, normally in your hippocampus for a temporary storage for a, a few um, a, um, hours or a day or so, and then you will retrieve that and work with it again over and over and over as you learn something. That is essentially, very simplistically in about 25 minutes, how we learn, the neuroscience of how we learn. We finish by giving you a couple of tips about how we can make this process more efficient when we're trying actively to really learn something in detail. For example, when we are trying to learn for um, assessments for exams. How can we help our hippocampus and our prefrontal cortex with this process? There are two things that we can do. One of these is something that I talk about over and over again, if you are one of our uh, undergraduate students watching this, you will have heard me talk about this multiple times. I'm going to talk about it again for a couple of minutes because it is really, really good and really, really helpful and effective way of studying. And that is what the psychologists will call retrieval practice. Essentially, engaging in activities which will drive this process of retrieval, make it easier for your hippocampus to gain access to your prior knowledge and bring it out so that it can be modified with the new thing that you're trying to learn. How do we do this? When, particularly when we're preparing for an exam, take practice exams. And there are lots of things that we do when we're preparing for an exam. We might read our notes. We might highlight our notes. We might read our notes again. We might watch the videos. The most effective thing that you can do essentially is to take practice exams. And better still is to write practice exams. So if you're taking an exam that's based upon multiple choice questions, write your own practice multiple choice questions. If you're taking an exam that is based upon writing long essays in an exam setting, you can still write practice multiple choice questions and they will help you learn the content more effectively. When you are writing those practice questions, you bring up your prior knowledge, you have to be confident with yourself that you know what the right answer to a question might be and what some plausible incorrect answers might be. And that is a really powerful way of learning that new content. It's part of why if you've ever learned with me and if you want to do the course and you will learn with me, we build this into our assessments to make sure that students are given some credit for doing it in an effective way. We advise students to do it as much as they can and to do it as soon as they can. So as soon as we've learned our lesson on apples, 
go and write some practice questions about apples if you really want to learn it in an effective way. It's very effective. There's a mountain of evidence that shows that it's effective. And it's also a really effective way of reducing the stress that many of us feel when we're doing exams. There's really good evidence to show this now, a paper that came out just last year. We all get stressed when we have to do an exam. One of the best ways of reducing that stress is to take practice exams. It shows us what success looks like. It prepares us for the eventual um, assessment itself. All of these processes drive retrieval, and that's how they work. Final thing we'll talk about then is an even easier study strategy. It is one of the most effective study strategies that we can do. It is enormously effective, and yet it is really, really easy to do. And yet very many of us don't do it anywhere nearly as often or for long enough as we should do. It is free. It is massively effective. It comes with a whole range of other benefits to us as well. And it is simply to sleep. Sleep is enormously important for learning. These processes that we talked about, these cycles of retrieval and reconsolidation, a huge amount of this happens while we sleep. Now, I told you at the beginning, we don't really know why evolution has forced us into these spending eight hours a day in this very vulnerable position, a third of our life in this very vulnerable position. But part of what we think is the explanation is because it allows us to make sense of what has happened during the day, to learn the things that we should do, to forget the things that we should do, and to process any complicated emotions and other learning that we have to do with that. And as we cycle through the different stages of sleep, we cycle through retrieval and reconsolidation. We take our prior knowledge, we update it with our new learning, we trim off the old learning, we send it back, and then we do that process over and over again. Part of that happens in particular while we are dreaming and we may even, uh, in, a, in a cognitive sense, be acting out the learning that we have done. We may be, when we're experiencing, dreaming about apples having watched that program this morning, that same thought processes, the same cognitive um, processes, the same brain reasons are active as they were when we were engaging with that content consciously and awake earlier that morning. It's just that we are asleep and not really therefore so aware of it. So what actually happens from a neuroscience perspective while we sleep? One of the things that happens that's really important is the thalamus shuts down into the, in, uh, the input of information into and out of these higher cortical centers. This is why when we're asleep, we're not really aware of what's going on in the world around us. So the thalamus says, okay, we shut down the content from the outside world. It doesn't completely shut down. If there's a loud noise or something important happens, it'll wake us up. But it's the thalamus that allows us to go to sleep by shutting down the um, input of information from external stimuli. It also doesn't let out the motor commands that we might that we do generate when we are dreaming, which is why most of us don't mostly act out our dreams. It does go wrong uh, sometimes for some people. But the thalamus essentially says, don't eat the apple in <laughs> whilst you are asleep. You can consciously feel like you are eating the apple, or sorry, subconsciously while you are asleep. And all of the, the other brain regions that are active while you do that will be active while you're dreaming about it, but you don't act upon them because the thalamus doesn't let that through. We have these repeated cycles of reconsolidation, as I said, where we integrate new knowledge with our prior knowledge and also with our prior emotions. And there's a whole load of synaptic biology that goes on while we do that, which is outside of the scope of what we're talking about this morning here. Essentially, at a cellular and molecular level, there's a whole lot of biology that happens that allows us to form these new memories and to store them effectively. Part of this involves clearing the temporary store of knowledge in the hippocampus. So when we're learning new memories, they get stored in first in the hippocampus, but the hippocampus itself has a limited capacity that has to be cleaned out, has to get shoved back into the cortex so that the hippocampus can carry on doing some new learning and that happens while we sleep. We know this because when people don't sleep, their learning is dramatically impaired. People who are completely de deprived of sleep show profoundly impaired learning. And even just having a, flu a few um, hours, uh, sorry, missing out on sleep by a couple of hours, so one or two hours off your eight hours, so you're only sleeping for six hours, your ability to learn is dramatically improved, uh, impaired, I should say. And part of that is because of a failure to clear the temporary store in the hippocampus. 
Um, we also know that if you take naps, particularly after a period of intense learning, your ability to learn is improved. So when you, uh, your partner or your parents scolds you at two o'clock in the afternoon because you're having a snooze on the sofa, you can tell them, I'm learning. And you are. Your learning is being improved while you do this. People who don't sleep for a long time will experience atrophy, which is essentially a shrinking of some important parts of the brain, the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Their function is impaired. And if you do that for a long period of time, they actually get a little bit smaller. And this has been studied in people who have done and have enough sleep, but also people whose circadian rhythms are profoundly disrupted. People like um, air stewards, they have problems um, with learning and they may actually have smaller uh, hippocampi and prefrontal cortices. This process is so important. Uh, we have all sorts of other problems that happen if we don't sleep. If you don't sleep for just two or three days, you become very, very ill. If you don't sleep for a few days longer than that, you will die. And the longest that anyone has ever been able to go without sleep is 11 days, which is, tells us about the profound importance of it. Okay, I'll stop there um, without nerding out too much on the importance of sleep and learning. Let me summarize. Learning is complicated and it's hard to do. It's a multi-stage integration of what you are, the new things that you're trying to learn with your prior knowledge of it. But if you want to make it less hard, take some practice tests, write some practice tests and sleep. Um, lots of things affect sleep. The final thing I will say is um, drinking caffeine. Lots of us do it. I've just done it. Don't do it after lunchtime and alcohol profoundly impairs our sleep, even just a little bit before we go to sleep. So just pay attention to that um, if you're able to. Um, do those things, you'll be in good shape, or at least you'll be in better shape than if you didn't do those things. Any questions about that? Uh, we've got a few moments now for some q and I can see we've had a couple of questions. Um, and uh, this is my email address, and I'm sure Bethany will share also the generic email address if you've got some questions about the program. And with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you so much to Professor Newton. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, that was that was really fascinating. Um, and I'm not sure whether I can do medical neuroscience, but <laughs> um, that was, you know, it was really interesting concepts. It's amazing to sort of learn, think about how much your brain is doing for you subconsciously, you know, without you even knowing. So that is really fascinating. We've got some great questions coming in. And the first question is, if you don't sleep well, can you train your brain to sleep? You you. Yes, you can. You can certainly do a lot that will improve your chances of falling asleep and then improve your chances of having a good night's sleep when you do that. Um, one of the couple of things I've already talked about, um, caffeine profoundly impairs our ability to sleep and it has a very long half-life. So the caffeine that you drink just after lunch will still be in your system when you go to bed. Um, and, it, and it does profoundly re reduce our ability to go to sleep. Alcohol does a similar thing. It makes us drowsy but it really impairs our ability to engage in some of the deeper, later stages of sleep, like REM sleep. So being careful with those sorts of things, um, having a consistent bedtime, re reducing um, distractors, not having the dog sleep on the end of your bed, um, making sure that it's dark, making the room cold is another really good way of um, getting a good night's sleep that people aren't always aware of. Being cold in the room and warm in bed is a really conducive way of getting a good night's sleep. Um, and then for people who are really struggling, not taking sleeping pills is something that um, is advised by people who are expert in the subject because they can be a temporary short-term fix, but they're very habit-forming and they don't actually result in a good night's sleep other than things like melatonin, which people can take for jet lag. Taken at the right time, that is a body's, your brain's trigger, that now is the time to go to sleep. So artificially triggering that by taking um, a melatonin can actually give you a really good night's sleep. And if people who are jet lagged, it's, it is actually really helpful. Um, so the short answer, yes. The long answer, hopefully I've just given you. Great, thank you. Um, I suppose another perhaps follow-up question in that sort of area of sleep is that you mentioned that the thalamus kind of shuts down, stops you from waking up. Um, I mean, I suppose perhaps for in different individuals, depending on your kind of prior experiences, um, you know, is is it more likely that you would wake up for certain things? You know, you mentioned that loud noises or something will wake you up. But I suppose for some individuals, perhaps... I don't know, depending on their work, for example, military or something like that, would that affect their, you know, would that have an effect of what would wake them up? Yes, yes, it really does. And I should be clear, the thalamus, I wouldn't say, doesn't necessarily close, shut down. It's actually very active, but it's, it's sort of standing guard at the gate, if you like. Um, and it's making sure that 
it sort of it raises the bar for the threshold at which external information can be let in. So if um, if there's some sounds outside or the sound of rain on the window, you, you, you just don't attend to it at all. If there's a very loud noise which signals danger, the thalamus will let that through and that'll wake you up very quickly. Um, those of us who've had young children, um, the sound of the young child crying, for example, that's something that your thalamus will say, you really should pay attention to this, that this is important, even though um, it's not attending to your sleep. And then for people, you know, for people in uh, with anxiety disorders, people who've got PTSD, for example, if that's arisen from um, an incident involving, let's say, gunfire, um, the sounds of things that sound a bit like gunfire, which even if they're, they're quite quiet, might not wake up other people, might act as a very serious salient trigger for people who do. So yes, your, your thalamus will be on the lookout for things that it, you should wake you up. And there will have been some learning, not necessarily done by the thalamus, done by other regions, which will talk to the thalamus, which will just say, this is important, you should wake up and deal with this. There is a, a final nerd thing that I will just briefly mention. Part of the reason we know this is because there is a profoundly tragic neurological disorder called fatal familial insomnia, where a part, two parts of the thalamus die through neurodegeneration, and the people who experience that then cannot fall asleep. It doesn't arise until midlife, sort of in their 30s, um, but what eventually kills them is that they can't fall asleep, and they, they develop dementia, hallucinations, all sorts of terrible neurological conditions, and they will eventually die, and that's part of how we know how important the thalamus is. Oh, thank you very much. Um, another question has come in, and this is, I understand that exposing information again and retrieving it again helps our brain to easily retrieve it. However, I've also heard how if we deeply process information by reflecting, elaborating on it might help us as well, even if we don't do it over and over again. What makes that mechanism different from repetitive exposure and retrieval? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, which I, which I must be careful not to give you a half hour answer to. Um, the short answer is that in many ways, they are the same thing. Um, so we can force retrieval by, let's say, taking a practice test. Um, we can also engage in retrieval by thinking about something, reflecting on it, taking a walk on the beach with the dog and just mulling it over, which is in a way kind of what happens while we are sleeping as well it's retrieved and it's sort of reflected on and, and mulled over and modified so um it, it's a really good question Manish and I would say um the process by which we do the retrieval might not be the same but the the fact that we have retrieved and then the modifications and, and consolidation is essentially the same thing it's part of something that lots of people are concerned about because um, okay, how long have we got? Um, there is an old, a, a, an old-ish literature about regions of the brain that were thought to be active while we were doing nothing, um, because people would do imaging experiments and they would ask people not to do anything whilst uh, to set a control condition, and those regions came to be called, going to be known as the default mode network. What we now know is the default mode network is what happens while is the reasons are the reasons that we're active while we were doing this reflection because there is no state when we our brain is inactive if you think about a time when you're not consciously engaged in a cognitive task you're normally thinking about the future or reflecting on the past and it's these regions the default mode network that are active and part of what they're doing in that rumination is is considering the new knowledge and updating our existing knowledge on the basis of what we've done. So um, it's my long-winded way of saying it's really the same thing, but we really do need to make sure we build time in our days for those reflective activities. And part of that as a third practical tip is if you are going to go on a walk um, or even just sit on a bus, don't get your phone out and check social media, stare out the window and the things that bubble up are the things that you probably need to be thinking about. Great, thank you. Um, I've just got a just around, you know, we've talked about the subject questions, which is fantastic. Um, but looking at the kind of like the program medical neuroscience, um, you know, looking at what students might be able to sort of go on to do after that, um, you know, what kind of insight have you got into that about in terms of you know what students might be able to go on to do, um, whether that's for employment, perhaps also in the field of academia as well. That's a really good question. So um, the answer is is quite a diverse 
um, like I said, it's quite a new program. So our first group of students is, is um, um, going through the final modules now. We've designed, so I'll tell you what we've designed for, to, to be able to do, and I'll tell you then what our current students tell me they want to do. So it's designed to allow students to, to learn more about neuroscience. That's the fundamental aim of it. And if students want to go on to work in the area, then obviously it will give them a leg up to be able to do that. So students who want to go and work, let's say, in the private sector for drug companies, for companies who do research on drugs for new neurological conditions, who then want to, to, to be involved in the, the marketing promotion of those drugs, so people who want to work in, in pharmaceutical sales and marketing, for example, all of those things, the research, the, the, the sales and marketing sector, this sort of course will help students with that. Um, it's also important to say that um, you know, with colleagues and friends who work in those industries, if a, um, someone wants to then go and work for those sorts of industries, but not necessarily on a neurological um, conditions, you know, other disease situations, the fact that students have got a master's, even if it is in, in a different subject, is helpful for the people making those employment decisions. Say this student is committed, they've done an advanced learning, they've done an independent project, this will help them with that. Um, some people want to go on to do further study. Um, and we have, it's designed to help students who want to do, let's say a PhD or, or a doctorate to be able to do that. And I know we have a, a good number of our current master students who are very interested in pursuing that. And we also have students who want to go on to do further study in the form of graduate entry medicine or pharmacy or physician's associate studies. Um, it's, it's advanced learning at master's level, which helps students with that. It's on a medical subject, which helps students with that. Um, we don't, necessarily advise students to do a master's course if they want to go on to do graduate entry medicine but my experience is that lots of students are doing it um and then related subjects so um science writing for example science communication um some students have told us they want to consider a career in teaching and they just want an advanced understanding of how people learn as a preparation for doing that um, and then they might want to go on to teach these subjects um as well so a lot is the short answer and the long answer is just a few examples of that. Brilliant, thank you, thank you so much. So we are sort of coming up to, to the end of our little in, in, insight and taste lecture into medical neuroscience. Hopefully that has either given you or increased your appetite for medical neuroscience. Um, certainly like, you know, that has just been a really great insight from my perspective. So I'm sure our registrar participants, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this as a recording, you know, will um, will be really sort of interested and hopefully um, it will give us some more people who are interested in coming to study with us at Swansea University. So I'm just going to briefly share my screen with you just so that you can make a note um, of our generic uh, general inbox so please do if you do have any questions that you would like to that you would like to ask then please do get in touch with us on study fmhls at swansea.ac.uk um, Professor Newton has kindly given his email address if you've got any questions um, furthermore about the the program or the subject please do contact him but you know if you if you do have any questions that you think of that you haven't had a chance to ask today or whether you think of them after the session's finished then please do get in touch with us on that email address study fmhls at swansea.ac.uk and we'll be very happy to to answer any and all of your questions so thank you so much everyone for taking the time to to join us today and to expand your knowledge about our fantastic program of medical neuroscience here at swansea and obviously you can see what a fantastic program director we have um and the, and the great you know tut the other lecturing team that we have as part of as part of the program as well so thank you so much to professor phil newton for giving us that sort of whirlwind but very very interesting insight into medical neuroscience so thank you all very much please do get in contact with us and we look forward to perhaps welcoming you to Swansea very soon thanks very much everyone Bye -bye. cheerio folks